Hey there, welcome back to Private Pilot Ground School. This is the second installation of the regulations video, and hopefully I can talk fast enough and you can understand quickly enough to get all of the information into your brain. Here are the FARs that will be covered in this video. Let's begin. 91.3, the PIC is the final authority and is directly responsible for the operation of the aircraft. If there's an emergency and you need immediate action, you can deviate from any rule in part 91 to meet that emergency. 91.7 says that the airplane has to be airworthy when you fly it, and you as the PIC is responsible for determining the airworthiness of the airplane. 91.9 says that the airplane must be flown within the limitations specified in the airplane manuals and the placards. This is also a good part to bring up what you need in the airplane as far as manuals and documents. The acronym is AERO, Airworthiness Certificate, Registration, Radio License if you decide to go out of the United States, the Operating Manual or the POH, and then the weight and balance, the actual weight of the airplane that you are flying, the actual tail number. 9115, can you drop things out of your airplane? The answer is yes, as long as you take precautions not to cause any damage or injury to persons or property on the ground. I would say don't do it unless you really know the people on the ground and they're totally okay with you dropping stuff on their land. 9117, alcohol and drugs. You need eight hours from bottle to throttle. You can't be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. You can't take anybody with you who's under the influence of either one of those things. And the blood alcohol content limit is 0.04, which is half of what it is for driving. Also, if you're asked to do a drug test, refusing to do so is a failure of the drug test. 91103 talks about pre-flight. As a pilot in command, you have to become familiar with all available information, it says. At a minimum, you need weather reports and forecasts. You need fuel requirements for that flight. You need an alternate in case you can't do the planned flight. And you also need runway lengths at the airports you plan to use and takeoff and landing distances for your airplane for that specific flight. So you actually have to pull out the book and look at those landing and takeoff distances. I will combine 91, 105, and 107 into one little blurb. Basically, seatbelts and shoulder harnesses is what it comes down to. Taxi takeoff landing, you need to have the shoulder harness on. All the other times, the seatbelt has to be on. And if you have passengers, you have to tell them to put their seatbelt on. 91, 111. What if you and your buddy want to fly right next to each other and do some maneuvers or whatnot? You can do that as long as A, you're not so close to another aircraft to create a hazard, and two, you have to be in agreement with the other pilot in command. So go out there and practice your Blue Angels maneuvers, just make sure you don't run into anybody. 91113 talks about the right of way. An aircraft in distress or in an emergency always has the right of way. Now, if you're converging, just think of it as a stop sign. Whoever's to the right has the right of way. So the person on the right, you have to give way to them. And then it goes by who is the least maneuverable. So a balloon has the right of way over other categories. And then it's a glider, and then it's an airship, powered parachute, weight shift, airplane, and rotorcraft. When it comes to landing, an aircraft on final or landing has the right of way over those operating on the surface. And then if there's two of you coming in to land, the one at the lowest altitude has the priority. 9117 talks about aircraft speeds. This might not apply to you for a little bit until you get into faster airplanes, but the maximum speed below 10,000 feet MSL is 250 knots within four miles of a class Charlie or a Delta airspace and up to 2,500 feet AGL, the speed is 200. The airspeed below a class Bravo airspace, so below the shelves, is 200 knots as well. Part 91.119 talks about minimum safe altitudes or how low can you go. If you're over a congested area or a yellow part on your chart, you have to be at least 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle and within a horizontal radius of 2,000 feet. If you're over a non-congested area, you have to be at least 500 feet above the surface. If you're over a sparsely populated area or over water, you have to be at least 500 feet away from any person, vessel, structure, or vehicle. So it doesn't necessarily mean height, it could be lateral as well, especially over water. So does this mean that you can fly 5 feet above the water over some deserted lake? Technically yes, but technically... The first part says you have to be at an altitude that will allow you to land without causing people or property damage if you happen to lose an engine. Part 91-121 talks about altimeter settings. And when you're below 18,000 feet MSL, you set your altimeter to the current station or a station within 100 miles of you. Above 18,000, you set it to 2992. 
part 91.123 talks about air traffic control clearances. It boils down to a couple points. One, if you get a clearance from air traffic control, it's a legal contract and you have to do it unless you get a different clearance. The only time you can deviate from a clearance is in an emergency. Also, the last one is you can't take somebody else's clearance. ATC light gun signals. In case you lose communication and you need to communicate with air traffic control, these are the signals that you can expect from them. They have a big giant light gun that they will shine at you from the control tower to give you instructions. This is something that's good to know but you don't necessarily have to memorize it. You can print it out and keep it on your clipboard or you can screenshot it and keep it on your iPad. This is something that you should have somewhere in the airplane accessible to you in case you lose communication. 91, 126 and 127 can be summarized as follows. If you're coming in to land at an uncontrolled airport, make left traffic pattern unless otherwise indicated. Some class G and E airports might be controlled by a control tower and in that case you have to establish radio communications before you get within 4 miles and 2500 feet AGL. Anytime you fly into controlled airspace, establish radio communications with ATC and do what they tell you. And then if you're going into class A airspace, you better be IFR certified and equipped. Fuel requirements for a VFR flight. You need enough fuel considering the weather and forecast to go to your destination and then 30 more minutes. If you're flying at night, it's 45 more minutes. Now this is common sense, but if you're doing a long cross country with five stops, you need to have fuel for all five of those legs plus 30 minutes after that. Basic and special VFR were covered in a separate video and the link will be in the description below for that. VFR cruising altitude. If you are in cruise and you're going east or between zero degrees and 179 degrees on a magnetic course, not heading, course, you need to be at odd thousand feet plus 500, so like 3,500, 5,500, 7,500, etc. And if you're going west from 180 to 359 degrees, you need to be at even plus 500, so 4,500, 6,500, etc. These altitudes apply when you're 3,000 feet or more AGL. 91203 talks about certificates required in the airplane. We already talked about the AERO acronym, but here's an additional thing, special flight permits. If your aircraft is unairworthy, the FAA may allow you to fly it even though it's not airworthy. They'll have stringent restrictions on what you can do, but that's another certificate that I don't think I've mentioned yet. 91205 is Instrument and Equipment Requirements. This is another little acronym that you should memorize and have in the back of your mind all the time. For day VFR flights, the acronym is Tomato Flames, and for night, it's FLAPS. Here's what all that stands for. Tachometer oil pressure gauge, magnetic compass, airspeed indicator, temperature gauge for each liquid cooled engine, oil temperature, fuel gauges, landing gear position indicator if you have retractable gear, altimeter, manifold pressure gauge if applicable, ELT, and seat belts. Those are the minimum things you need in order to fly your airplane during day VFR. At night, you need all the day stuff plus fuses slash circuit breakers, landing light, anti-collision or strobe lights, position lights, and a source of adequate electrical power other than the battery, so like an alternator. Your airplane needs to have an ELT install and that's the emergency locator transmitter. Batteries in the ELT need to be replaced or recharged if they're rechargeable if the transmitter has been in use for more than one cumulative hour or when 50% of the useful life is gone. Besides those requirements, the ELT has to be inspected every 12 calendar months. And if you need to fly an airplane without an ELT installed or operable, there are some provisions for that in the rest of the part, so you might want to check it out. 91209 talks about aircraft lights, and we already covered those. Basically, if you're flying at night and you have collision lights and position lights, use them. When you fly a non-pressurized airplane, which you most likely are flying, you need to have supplemental oxygen if you go above a certain altitude. For 30 minutes or longer, above 12,500 feet, up to 14,000 feet, you need to have supplemental oxygen. Above 14,000 feet, the flight crew needs oxygen, and then above 15,000 feet, each person has to be using oxygen. 91215 transponders. You need them in three places. Anytime you're above 10,000 feet, anytime you're inside the Moat Sea Vale around Class Bravo airspace, and in and above Class Charlie airspace. The rest of part 91 is about maintenance and here's the summary of the whole thing. Basically anytime maintenance is performed, it has to be recorded in the maintenance logbook. 
there's a lot of things that you can't do but there's a lot of things that you can do and we talked about that in the last video that's preventative maintenance in part 43 as the owner or operator you have to make sure that the airplane is maintained properly and if you're the pilot in command you have to make sure the airplane is airworthy and to do that you have to make sure these following inspections are complied with and the acronym is AVIATE you need to make sure that an annual is done within the preceding 12 calendar months if you're flying in IFR conditions you need to make sure that the VOR has been checked within the preceding 30 days the I stands for 100 hours if the airplane is used for hire it needs to be inspected every 100 hours and that includes being used for flight instruction the altimeter but more specifically the pedostatic system has to be inspected every 24 calendar months and this is for IFR only the transponder you need to have that inspected within the preceding 24 calendar months and then the ELT as I mentioned before preceding 12 calendar months or if there's an expiration date whatever comes first once again these are all calendar months meaning that it's good until the end of the month the very last part I will cover is the NTSB requirement if you're looking for it, it's Title 49 and not Title 14. 49 deals with transportation, 14 is air and space. 49 Part 830 is NTSB. There's a couple things. First of all, you have to notify the NTSB of these following things if they happen. If you're an operator of an airplane that's involved in an accident or incident, until the NTSB gets there, there's a couple things that you have to be aware of. First of all, help the people if they're injured or trapped. Your next priority is to protect the airplane from more damage and then to protect the public at large. And the main thing here is don't move anything until the NTSB gets there. And if it does have to be moved, take pictures or make sure you preserve the records of what happened so the NTSB can have a better idea when they investigate. And finally, the operator has to file a report with the NTSB within 10 days after an accident. So we're finally done with the regulations. Hopefully you learned something and hopefully it wasn't too boring and put you to sleep. It's really hard to make lawyer crafted documents sound fun. So I hope you learned something. Come back next time for another video. Until then, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.